If I were to ask you, who are you, you would probably identify yourself by either telling me what kind of occupation you were in, or more than likely, you would describe yourself by giving me a relationship of some kind. You are somebody's wife or somebody's husband. Uh, you might mention a brother or a sister. You might even mention your parents, but we sort of identify ourselves by our relationships. If you have trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, then you have established a relationship with him and, for that matter, all others who have been born again. As a matter of fact, the Bible uses family terminology to describe us. It just starts with the fact that we're born again, meaning we're born spiritually when we trust Jesus Christ for the gift of eternal life. And then way beyond that, it speaks of God as our heavenly Father. It refers to us, one another, as brethren and sisters in Christ. The Bible is full of that. Jesus said, this is the way you ought to pray, our Father who art in heaven. Matter of fact, that's really revolutionary in terms of the fact that the Old Testament never referred to God as a Father. Jesus introduced that in the Lord's Prayer. But beyond that, others did the same thing. In the little book of 1 John, he is constantly calling the people receiving the book little children. So that the Bible thinks of us as having a relationship with God as father and children. Matter of fact, uh, believers are called brothers, as I mentioned before. So here's what I want to ask today. How do children of God relate to God as a father? Peter answers that question in 1 Peter chapter 1. So will you turn with me to the first chapter of 1 Peter? If you do not have a Bible, there's one in the pew rack before you, and I would invite you to turn with me. Several weeks ago, we started going through the book of 1 Peter, and we've come now to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, where Peter says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that it is to be brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the, your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. But through him be, believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, Throughout this passage, the idea of a father-child relationship is again and again emphasized. Look at verse 2. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Look at verse 4, an inheritance incorruptible. And that again is a, a reference to the fact that we are God's children. Look at verse 14. He says, as obedient children. And again, in verse 17, he says, and if you call on your father. 
So throughout the passage, he's emphasizing this father-child relationship to describe our relationship with the Lord. Now, you need to know about this relationship. And you need to know about it. For one thing, we're members of the family, the family of God. But according to Peter in this first chapter, as I pointed out when we looked at the previous verses, we're to do that to salvage our life. He uses the little expression, the salvation of your souls, in verse 9. And as I explained when we looked at that verse, the word soul is the Greek word suke. It simply means life. We usually say we're saved, our souls were saved in terms of going to heaven. But the way that phrase is used in this passage, it's talking about salvaging our life, saving our life from being wasted. That after you come to know the Lord, you could uh, waste your life in terms of eternity. And what Peter is concerned about is that you not do that. He's also concerned that there is a time before the Father when we would receive rewards. He talks about that in this passage. He says that in verse 7, that there will be praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, so that when we stand before the Lord, we can be praised, well done, thy good and faithful servant. There can be honor and glory at that point, or there could be shame, according to John, in 1 John chapter 2. So Peter is concerned that we salvage our lives, And that we be rewarded when we stand before the Lord for what we've done after we trusted Christ. And so what he does is he starts through his book and he takes one relationship after another. And talks about how we should respond in that because we need to save our lives, salvage our lives from being wasted. Or to say that same thing another way. What Peter does is he addresses virtually every area of our life so that we can save that area of our life. And he begins with talking about our relationship to the Lord himself. And that's the paragraph I just read. So the issue is, what is my relationship with the Lord like? Uh, How should I relate to the Lord? And in this passage... He mentions three things. Now, I know preachers are notorious for having three points. But I assure you, that's the nature of this paragraph. I didn't put these three points in it. I got it out of the passage. The three points are, we are to, number one, hope. I'll talk about that in a second. The second thing we are to do is be holy. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then he says we should fear. Now, when you hear that word, you immediately think of being scared or terrified. So I'm going to say that that's not exactly the meaning of the word, although that may be involved. Uh, But I'm going to prefer to call it a heavenly fear. So if you would like to know how to relate to your father, your heavenly father, here it is. You hope, you be holy, and you have a heavenly fear. Now let me explain those three things. Let's begin with verse 13. Therefore, he says, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and rest. Do you mind if I get technical for a minute? In order to explain this verse, I have to get technical. Will you let me be technical? You're going to love this. Did you enjoy grammar when you were in school? I didn't even understand grammar when I was in school. What are you talking about? I'm serious. I, I didn't understand grammar until I got to college and had to take Greek. Um, all right. To be technical for just a second, that verse sounds like there are three commands. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, rest. Those are commands, right? In English, that's right. But actually, this verse is not accurately translated. In the Greek text, there's only one command here, and that is hope. 
he says in verse 13, rest your hope. That's the command. The other two words are actually participles that describe that hope to some degree. So the one command in verse 13 is that you hope. Now, let's talk about that hope. What does he mean? Well, the Greek word hope means expectation. When we use the English word hope, the idea is, well, we hope so. That's not the view of the word in the New Testament at all. It means I'm expecting it, and there's a certainty about the word that's not in the English word. So he's telling us to expect something. Well, what's he telling us to expect? Well, notice that the verse begins with the little word, therefore. Based on what he said in the previous paragraph, we ought to rest in hope. Well, what did he say in the previous paragraph? Well, it's what I just mentioned a minute ago. It's that you need to salvage your life. Don't waste it. You need to anticipate the praise, honor, and glory that you could receive at the judgment seat of Christ. Because those things are critical. Therefore, rest in hope, he says. Fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now put verse 13 with verse 7. That you be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He's saying that when the Lord comes, when we stand before him, there's going to be praise, honor, and glory if you've responded properly. And so he mentions that at verse 7, and he brings it up again at verse 13. So this is our expectation. Our expectation is that the, the reward, he calls it grace in verse 13, that we're going to receive at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the point is hope. Got it? Expect. That's what's going to happen. Now, in order to get that done, here's what you need to do. You need to gird up the loins of your mind. What in the world does that mean? When was the last time you told somebody to gird up the loins of your mind? Well, let me explain. In the first century, when this was written, men wore robes. And the robes were all the way down to their feet. Now, if they had to move quickly, what they would do is gird up the loins. They had a belt, sometimes it's called a girdle around their waist, and they would gather up their skirt and tuck it under uh, the robe and tuck it under the belt. So it would look like, I guess, a girl wearing a short skirt. At any rate, that made it possible for them to move more quickly. And that's the kind of thing he's saying. I think if we were saying this today, we might say something like, roll up your sleeves or take off your jacket and go to work. And he's just using a figure of speech, only he's applying it to the mind. Instead of letting your robe flow all over the place, gird it up. Uh, roll up your sleeves mentally because we've got work to do. So what is the point? It is simply this. Wandering thoughts tangle you up and impede rapid progress. So don't let your mind, or your, I should say your mental skirt drag. Tuck in vague, loosely flowing thoughts. Loose thinking, as somebody has said, is the forerunner of loose living. A disciplined mind is essential to disciplined living. Discipline your mind. Don't daydream about sin. Set your mind on things above. Now, in the context of this passage, he's saying... Gird up your mind in expectation of what's coming in the future. Think about this. Think about it with a disciplined mind. 
One commentator said, and I quote, The Christian cannot expect to please God if he is not willing to work hard at thinking. The great emphasis upon experience and emotion that is overwhelming Western society, and many churches too, is sheer poison because it leads to interpretation of God's truth through experience rather than interpreting experience through God's truth. The Bible must interpret experience. It may not be interpreted by it. End of quote. He goes on to say, the believer who refuses to think, who takes the course of least resistance, drifting with the crowd or circumstances, or holding his feelings, following his feelings, sins against God. In short, believers are to gather up their wandering thoughts and focus their attention on the fact that they're going to stand before the Lord and hear, well done, or they're going to be ashamed of the way they live. So, can I say it simply? Think. 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 By the way, that's out of vogue today. We want to be entertained. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what we want. That's what's popular. So what's popular? Sports. And as you know, I'm a sports fan. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying uh, it's taken over. That's, we're, we're obsessed with sports or movies. We want to be entertained, and it's affected the church. We want to come to church and be entertained so that we uh, don't want to have to think. We want to be amused, right? Do you agree? Do you know what the word amuse means? You know, muse means to think. And A, before a word, negates it. So a theist is somebody that believes in God. An atheist is somebody who does not believe in God. We negate the word by putting a little A in it. We learned that from the Greeks, by the way. So to be amused, we want amusement, literally means don't think. And that's the way we operate as a society. We don't want to have to think. We want to be entertained, and we want to be amused. We want amusement. So Peter says, look, in terms of your relationship with your heavenly Father, what you need to do is gird up the loins of your mind. Think straight. Matter of fact, I've seen that we're coming up with a new television program called Living Biblically. Have you heard about this? Some of you have. It hasn't started yet. It starts uh, on a Monday night toward the end of the month. I can't wait to see how they are going to portray living biblically. Well, the little phrase I had a professor use over and over in seminary was, think biblically. Now, if you're going to live biblically, you've got to first think biblically. You've got to think. You can't just think. Feel, you got to think. We put all the emphasis on feeling and not thinking. All right, there's more. Because the idea is, it's this expectation that you ought to be thinking about. There's another command in verse 13. He says, and be sober. Literally it means, and don't get drunk. But here it's being used figuratively of be serious. So you're to think, that's the idea, you are not to um, let your mind wander. As a matter of fact, let me just read you what some people have said about this. It is an attitude of self-discipline. That is, in contrast to the reckless irresponsibility of self-indulgence on the one hand and religious ecstasy on the other. A spirit-filled believer is not carried away like a drunk man into abnormal extravagance 
or acts as one in but acts as one in full possession of himself. Another says, it is level headedness, a calm, steady state of mind that evaluates things correctly so that it is not thrown off balance by new and fascinating ideas. Another says, it forbids any laziness of mind which lulls the Christian into uh, sin, sinful thoughts carelessly. It is level-headedness. A Christian is not uh, let his feelings overcome his thoughts. Get the point? Hope. Expect what's coming. And in order to do that, you have to gird up the loins of your mind. And you have to be level-headed and serious about what you let your mind think about. Years ago, there was an evangelist in the South named Bob Jones. He is very famous for a number of things, but one is that he kept saying, don't sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. I think Peter would say it like this, don't sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the temporal. Now that really captures what verse 13 is all about. That is, I am to expect, I'm to think about that expectation of being before the Lord. So don't just think about the temporal, the immediate, and sacrifice the eternal on that altar. That's the point. Is the great aim of your life something in this life, or is it something in the next? Are you living for the age to come, or are you living for this age? Are you living for time, or are you living for eternity? Peter would say, think, anticipate, expect that you're going to appear before the Lord and live in light of that. And in order to do that, you're going to have to gird up the loins of your mind and think seriously and level-headedly about life and the future. So if you want to relate to your heavenly father, that's the first thing you need to do. Live in hope of the grace that is revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second thing he says is be holy. Now let's look at that a little carefully. It starts in verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. Now, what he's saying is simply this. Don't live like you used to before you were converted. In your ignorance is meaning your ignorance of God before you came to know Christ, before you trusted him. You live ignorant of God. Now, as obedient children, now you have a relationship with God as a father. So as obedient children, he says, do not conform yourself to those former lusts. The Greek word translated conformity here only appears twice in all of the New Testament. The other verse you know well. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world. Same word. Here, Peter says, don't be conformed to your former lust. Now we hear the word lust and what's the first thing you think about? sex, right? In the New Testament, the word simply means desire. Now, it can refer to sexual desire, but it is not limited to sexual desire. As a matter of fact, it can be the desire for anything. Uh, if it's not sex, what is it? How about materialism? You walk around thinking about the next gadget you want, some people just live for materialism so they can get more things. It's a game. The one who has the most when they die wins kind of thing. I talked to a lady recently whose mother is a Christian, and she was lamenting how her mother has just lived to collect things. She just buys and buys and buys until she said, 
you go to where she lives and it's stacked to the ceiling. You have to have a little path to get through it all. Now that's an extreme case. Comes to mind because I had that conversation recently. But that little virus has affected a lot of us, maybe all of us, that we just want things. We lust after things. Or the desire could be jealousy. That those are the kinds of things we did before we came to Christ. And that's the kind of thing Peter is talking about. As we go through the rest of this book, he will mention things like that that we should not do. So, he's saying, be holy. That's the point he's going to make. But first of all, that means you're not going to live like you used to live. By the way, what does that mean? Does that not imply you could? Could you live like you used to? Could you, could you trust Jesus Christ and know for sure you're going to heaven and live like you used to? Yeah, you could. The way some preach today, you can. Matter of fact, I heard some illustrations of that recently that blew my mind. Uh, preachers saying that if you're really saved, you wouldn't do that kind of thing. And when I hear that, I want to think, did you ever read the Bible? You kidding me? Sure you can live the way you used to. Just read the Bible. And then open one eye and just look around you. I mean, people that know the Lord do all kinds of stupid stuff. Right? And this verse implies that. He is saying, don't do that. In contrast to that, he says in verse 15, But he, as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy as I am holy. So the point of verses 14, 15, and 16 is be holy. Don't live like you used to, but be holy. Now we need to talk about that for a second. Uh, in the first place, um, let me just point out that when he says as, as it is written he's talking about the book of Leviticus uh, one of the most famous verses in the book of Leviticus is chapter 11 verse 44 that says I am holy so you be holy matter of fact that's mentioned three times in the book of Leviticus so the reason we are to be holy is because God is holy as you've heard me say before, when I started out in the ministry, which was many years ago, I spoke to young people a lot. And back in those days, as today, sex was a problem. So I had a sermon on sex. Why you should not have sex before marriage. And I listed all these reasons why you should not have sex before marriage. And some of them were very powerful. I thought so. So I listed, I think it was 10 reasons. And then one day it dawned on me, none of that's in the Bible. It's true. You shouldn't because of all kinds of things. But none of that's in the Bible. The Bible says there's just one reason why you shouldn't do it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Hello, it's one of the ten. In, it made it to the top ten. But you notice that's in Exodus 20, and at the beginning of that passage he says, For I have redeemed you out of Egypt. So according to the Bible, the one reason you ought to not do that is you know Jesus Christ and you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't live like you used to. You should not do that. So, the argument in this passage is, be holy because your father, as obedient children, your father is holy, so you be holy. So this is like a human father saying to his kids, behave, act like our family. Or a king saying to his son, remember you are royalty, act with a little dignity. So likewise, the heavenly father says, you're my child. I am holy, I want you to be holy. Now exactly what does that mean? All right, we should do that so that we can uh, be like our Father. But what does it mean to be holy? 
Well, the word means to be set apart, to be separated. When I first became a Christian, uh, I was introduced to this concept. Of, only they didn't call it holy. They called it living a separated life. Now, I, I came to the Lord when I was a teenager. And uh, prior to that, as a teenager, uh, one of my activities was going to movies. I did it all the time. Didn't think anything about it. And the church I got saved in informed me that you shouldn't do that. Why? Well, you've got to live a separated life. Going to movies has not been separated. How many of you ever heard that? You ever done that? You ever heard that? Yeah, okay. And so I quit going to movies. Am I holy? Not even close. I mean, there are all kinds of Christians that don't go to movies and all the kinds of things they do besides, and they think, well, I'm spiritual because I don't go to movies. And there's a whole list of, there's a man-made mandate of huge, of, you know, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls that do. You know the story. <laughs> all right. I'm going to give you a list of what it means to be holy. You ready? Put your finger in First Peter. We're coming back and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You want to know how to be holy? I'm going to tell you. And the list is real interesting. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of your mind. Translated, don't live like you used to before you became a Christian. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he goes on to explain, verse 25, therefore put away lying. Let everyone speak truth to his neighbor. Verse 26, be angry and don't sin. Verse 27, don't give place to the devil. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the necessary edification. Don't tear down, build up. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave you. That is the kind of holiness the Bible is after. Any of that speak to you? Did any of that cover anything you're doing or not doing? Well, just in case I missed you, turn to Philippians chapter 2. There's another list. And keep in mind, these lists are exactly what Peter is talking about. Don't live like you used to, but live righteously and holy, separated unto the Lord. Separation gets interpreted many oft times as separated from, and it includes some of that, provided it's biblical. But it's also separated to the Lord. So I want you to look at Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Look at what he says. Verse 15, that you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You want to be really different than the world? Quit griping. Quit complaining. That's what it means to be holy. And so I am in contrast to the world. I don't complain, the scripture would say. All right. Now, there is a third thing in this passage. And that is, back in 1 Peter, he says, in essence, fear. The first thing is, you should have this expectation, this hope. The second is, you should be holy. The third is, you should fear. So look at verse uh, 17. And if you call on the Father. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, stop. Wait a minute. What? If you call on the Father. 
Keep in mind, throughout this passage, it's this whole family thing. God is my father, and I'm his child. And now he says, if you call on the Lord, your father. Now, let me explain something. That's very important. Don't slide over that phrase. Part and parcel of living the Christian life is uh, just this. It's calling on the Lord. I just said, be holy, and listed a whole bunch of things that includes. In order to pull that off, you know what you need to do? Call on the Lord. This Greek word actually means to call for aid, to call for help. So the Bible tells us we should live a godly, righteous, holy life. And you go out and try to do that in your own strength and you fall flat on your face. Because you miss this little phrase, calling on the Lord. You've heard me quote this verse before and you'll hear me quote it again. Hebrews 4.16 Come boldly to the throne of grace that you might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So you can come boldly before the Father and say, I'm struggling with this. Help, I need your grace. First, I need your mercy because I just blew it. Now I need your grace to help me do it right. That's calling on the Lord. In this case, calling on the Father, he says. All right. But call on the Father for help. Now back in 1 Peter 1, 1 17, he says, who without partiality judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Live in fear. Now, wait a minute. At one point, he says, he's your father. Should you fear your father? He says it in the same verse. I thought fathers were supposed to love their children. They are. Matter of fact, our father loved us. Look at verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct. By the way, that little phrase aimless really gets at what I think Peter's doing in this whole book. It means useless. Don't spend your life uselessly, aimlessly, wasting it in terms of the Lord in eternity. But he says you were redeemed from that, not by silver and gold, but, verse 19, by the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish and without spot. For indeed, he, God the Father, had foreordained before the foundation of the world and manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope may be in God. All of those verses are saying God loves you. God redeemed you from this useless, aimless life. And he wants you to love him in return. We love him because he first loved us. So God the Father loves us. I go back to verse 17. Who ought without partiality judges according to each man's work. Wow. Would you look at that verse? Father, judge, fear. Anytime you see in the New Testament that we're going to be judged by our works, by the way, all judgment is by works. But for a Christian, that means God is going to evaluate everything we do to determine what kind of reward we have in heaven. You know the passage, 1 Corinthians 3 all of our works are going to be put in a pile and tested by fire, and some are wood, hay, and stubble, and others are gold, silver, and precious stones. That's what he's talking about. And God's going to judge. So we should fear standing before him. That's what this passage is teaching. 
I guess the question is, what is fear? Well, uh, we hear the word fear, we think of being afraid, maybe even terror. And uh, maybe we should be afraid of the Lord. You know one of the problems with this age? We have no fear of God anymore. In that sense, maybe we should. But, and some time ago I did a rather detailed study of this word and fear, especially in the book of Proverbs, and concluded that it meant awe and reverence. That's the meaning of the word. Now, does it mean be afraid? Yes. I don't want to leave that out. But that's not the basic idea. The first idea is that we just stand in awe and reverence before the Lord. So when it says you're going to be judged by him, so fear. I think he's saying if you had this awe of the Lord and reverence for him as your father, ah, then you'd, well, you'd fear. And maybe the idea is you'd just be disappointed that you'd, that you'd, you'd, be, you'd regret that you disappointed him. Is that sort of the idea? I have, to, I have to tell you, I have no idea what this is like, personally, because my mother and father divorced when I was six. My father flew the coop, died sometime thereafter, and I have no idea what it means to fear uh, a father, because I never had one. But I know somebody who did. As a matter of fact, the greatest illustration of this I know is my wife, who adores her father. I and do. and uh, so I've asked her to tell you about fearing your father. Do you fear your father? In the most loving and honorable way, yes. Many times when people come to the church and they... Um, for the first time, before they know this relationship, um, I will introduce myself, and I will say, maybe you'll be about my father, Jack Smith. And they say, oh, Jack, such a lovely gentleman. And in those moments like that, it reminds me of just how honored and how proud I am, Daddy, to be your daughter. That Daddy is a man of, of to be respected, and it just, and it just shows so many great qualities. And um, there are so many, so many reasons that I am grateful that Jack Smith is my father. And we don't have time to go through that list because you will be here all day. And those of you who know how I feel about my daddy know that we will be here all day. So I'd like to just highlight this because of your sermon today, uh, Pastor, is that it's so easy for me to believe that God loves me and that God wants the best for me and that, I don't know, maybe I'm his favorite. I'm not sure. I might be God's favorite <laughs> because, because of the example that my father has been, that he's been loving, fair, clear of his expectations, clear of the consequences, but it's all done with such love. Reminds me of when I was a little girl, and um, I was raised in such a loving, God-honoring home, and Daddy did really kind of represent maybe what God was like. Very loving, very fair, and very clear of what was expected, and clear of, of, of the consequences. So um, at the house that we lived in, it had a very, very, very long hallway. Now, as I've grown up, that hallway has shortened considerably. But it used to be a much longer hallway. And on those occasions when I would choose to um, make a decision that was a, I mean, a choice that was against what was expected of me, I was to meet Daddy down the hallway. And again, that was a very long hallway. But it was there that I was met with a gracious, loving, Father, but we had this discussion. Did you know what was expected? Did you make a choice that was um, against that? Yes. So it was at those moments that I, that I, in the biblical sense,
feared my father. Not that he would be angry with me, but that he would be disappointed in me. So I can remember having a little discussion with him and then hugging and him telling me that he loved me and then going to my bedroom. I will be 62 in May. I can still feel the emotion of laying on my bed in a curled up position and crying, not because I got in trouble, but because I disappointed my daddy. So daddy, I thank you and I honor you and I do have this sense of awe and respect for you and such great love for so many reasons, but for teaching me and showing me the example of what God is like. And now I can, I've been able to transfer, not wanting to disappoint daddy to this day, but not wanting to disappoint my heavenly father. How's that for an illustration? <laughs> Living illustrations here. All right, <clears throat> the point is that the fear just may involve, I don't want to disappoint him. All right. How are we doing? We got this today? Talking about your relationship with your heavenly father. And if I were going to try to put this passage together really simply, I'd say it like this. God's children, that is believers, should firmly fix their expectation on future glory and in the meantime live holy lives in fear of their heavenly father. Impartial. Heavenly Father. Or to say it all very simply, in three words, you should live in hope, expectation of standing before the Lord. In the meantime, be holy and do it with a heavenly fear. Got it? Going to remember it? Here's what I want you to remember. Real simple. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven, regardless of what you do. The Bible teaches God gives you the gift of eternal life. And that is never going to be in question. Got it? So all you have to do to go to heaven is trust Jesus Christ. That makes you a child of God, and nothing you do or don't do can change that. It's a sealed, settled deal. That is who you are. You are a child of God. Amen. The problem is we forget where we're going as God's children. And we get our eyes on the present and we forget the future. So what God wants is for us to remember who we are and where we are going. And where we're going is glory. We're going to go and stand before our loving Father who is also our judge. But he's going to do it without partiality. Just because you're his child, you don't get any favorites because it's going to be based on your works. And that's going to determine whether you rule over ten cities or five. In other words, there are degrees of reward in heaven. The Bible is very clear about that. So remember not only who you are, but where you're going. That says it all very simply in this passage. <coughs> Billy Graham was given an award in Charlotte, North Carolina, a number of years ago. And as he accepted the award, he told this story. He said that when there was a time when Albert Einstein was traveling on a train from Princeton to New Jersey, when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets of each passenger, when he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his pocket for the ticket, and it wasn't there. He reached in another pocket, and it wasn't there. And the conductor said, 
uh, Mr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, we know who you are. It's okay. And, and he kept looking. And the conductor, knowing who he was, just, I'm sure you paid for the ticket, went down the aisle, punching tickets. And uh, he turned around, and Einstein was looking in the seat next to him. He was looking in his briefcase. Uh, and, and again, the conductor went back and said, Dr. Einstein, it's okay. It's okay. I know who you are. I'm sure you bought the ticket. It's okay. And he turned to leave again. And he got to the door to go into the next car, and he turned around, and Einstein was on his knees on the floor looking for the ticket. So the conductor came back, and he said, Dr. Einstein, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. And he said, you don't understand. I know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> now, Billy Graham used it to say he knew where he was going. And I'm going to use it to say we forget where we're going. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.